Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday Night Family Support Group. I'm Dominique. I'm the social worker here at Changes. Um, and yeah, tonight I'm going to be speaking just around the 12-step program, primarily focusing obviously on, on the 12 steps as well as what we call the five pillars. So a lot of you have your loved ones come into treatment and you hear a lot about 12 steps, 12 steps, five pillars, all of this stuff. And most of you may or may not know what that all entails and what that's about. Um, so yeah, this is one of the, the sort of programs that we focus on in, in treatment as well, just to help your loved ones get you know, connected to it so that by the time they leave, they've got something that they can follow to assist them in their recovery journey going forward. So yeah, when we look at the 12 step program, it's, it's the, the sort of definition of it is, is that it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's programs, it's a mutual aid organizations for the purpose of recovery from substance addictions, behavioral addictions and compulsive compulsions, sorry. <laughs> it was developed in the 1930s. Uh, the first 12 step program, Alcoholics Anonymous, or no, otherwise known as AA, has aided its membership to overcome alcoholism. Since that time, dozens of other organizations have been derived from AA's approach to address problems as varied as drug addiction, compulsive gambling, and overeating. All 12 step programs utilize a version of AA's suggested 12 steps, which were first pu published in the 1939 book, which is the Alcoholics Anonymous, <clears throat> the story of how more than 100 men have recovered from alcoholism. So yeah, this was a program that was developed, like they say, in the 1930s. It was developed by, <clears throat> excuse me, by two gentlemen, um, a doctor and another gentleman. And what they did was they came up with these 12 steps um, that would assist in helping anyone that had an addiction or an alcohol problem. How they did that was that they learned, they didn't just come up with these 12 steps they didn't just think about them they didn't just write them down <laughs> um, you know they were they were actually sort of steps that they took that they practiced in their lifestyle and in their everyday life in order for them to recover they found what worked they found what didn't work and through all of that they managed to come up with 12 simple steps that are there to assist someone who is trying to overcome an addiction um, as they say there, other, other sort of programs derived from the AA program. So there's a lot of other sister fellowships is what we call them that started to form. I think Narcotics Anonymous started in 1953 where they applied the same steps in their programs um, <clears throat> in order to help people with addiction. And obviously it's spread from there. There is more information on that further and I will go into more detail about that later. Um, come on screen. Okay. So as summarized by the American Psychological Association or the APA, the process involves the following. Admitting that one cannot control one's alcoholism, addiction, or compulsion. That is where we sort of look at the step one stuff. And it's the one thing that we focus primarily on, primarily on in primary addiction is that we're trying to work through the person's denial. We're trying to get them to admit that they can't control their substance use. Um, they can't control, they've got, they, you know, they can't, they've tried to stop on their own, own, it hasn't worked, they've tried to seek out different sort of resources to stop, it hasn't worked, some people have been to multiple institutions which haven't worked, so the first main priority or the main point that we focus on in treatment or in primary treatment is specifically that we need to get them, we need to get your loved ones to admit that they have a problem and that they can't control it. Um, one of the other steps is coming to believe in a higher power that can give strength. So that's usually, I'll go into more detail around the steps later, but, you know, a lot of addicts and alcoholics run on self-will and they run on making their own decisions and kind of trying to run their whole life. It's almost like they become the, the director of their life and they're trying to arrange, you know, the actors, the lights, the ballets, the music, um, and nothing is going their way. So they get a bit annoyed and they get their expectations are not met and they start to become resentful. Here we also teach them to get a higher a connection to a higher power. Um, we don't 
this is a very spiritual program so we try and you know encourage your loved ones to sort of whatever they believe in they can use as a as a higher power in terms of you know connecting and being able to hand over their will to that higher power and then it's also examining the past areas with the help of a sponsor or an experienced member i will get into more detail about that later making amends for these errors <clears throat> this one is very important because you know there's the 12, set, the 12 steps are set in a certain way. So we can't expect loved ones to just apologize for their behavior, you know, straight off the bat in primary care, coming to treatment. So I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do all of this to you. Um, they can't, the whole point about making amends is not saying sorry. Making amends is admitting and taking responsibility for their behavior during the act of addiction and then we're actively working on changing that behavior so that they aren't you know sorry it just doesn't so it's not going to be like i'm sorry and it doesn't mean anything so they actually have to take responsibility for their behavior and then change that behavior in in the sense of amends um, it's also learning to live a new life with a new code of behavior and lastly one of the most important steps is to help others who suffer from the same alcoholism addiction or compulsions Okay, if we have a look at the overview, I'm just going to move this out the way. So in terms of the 12 step program, there's a bit of the, the, overview, the overview says that 12 step methods have been adapted to address a wide range of alcoholism, substance abuse and dependency problems. Over 200 self help organizations often known as fellowships with a worldwide membership of millions now employ 12 step principles for recovery. Narcotics Anonymous was formed by addicts who do not relate to the, spe the specifics of alcohol dependency. Demographic preferences related to the addict's drug of choice has led to the creation of Cocaine Anonymous, Crystal Meth Anonymous, and Marijuana Anonymous. Behavioral issues such as compulsion for and or addiction to gambling, crime, food, sex, hoarding, getting into debt and work are addressed in the fellowships such as Gamblers Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Sexaholics Anonymous, and Debtors Anonymous. Um, you'd be very surprised if you actually Googled, <laughs> if you Googled anything, you would probably find some form of anonymous meeting <laughs> for, for that. I know that Debtors Anonymous is fairly new to South Africa, but it has been around worldwide for, for quite some time. Um, I know that Marijuana Anonymous has just recently reopened in South Africa. Um, you know, there's just, there's a sort <sighs> There's a social media anonymous. There's there's a lot of different fellowships that are forming and growing along uh, throughout the world that apply this twelve step program in terms of you know trying to assist someone with a certain addiction. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to get into what the twelve steps are and sort of just a quick rundown <laughs> um, because there's a lot that can go to it but this is just basically an explanation of what the 12 steps are so the first step in the alcoholics well <clears throat> in the alcoholics anonymous program is that we admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable so this is always the first step that someone would take into you know admitting that they have a problem it can be in many forms by either just going to an AA meeting, by booking themselves into treatment, by reaching out to family members that, you know, I'm done, I can't, I can't do this anymore, um, and that their lives have become unmanageable. So a lot of denial forms when people come often come into treatment, their lives are functioning, they still have a job, they still have, um, you know, their families are still around. So that's where that den denial could fall that, but my life isn't unmanageable. Um, but unmanageable doesn't necessarily mean that it's an external factor. So yes, someone could be functioning um, in their everyday life, but it does not mean that they're not an alcoholic or an addict. Um, there's something that we call um, inner unmanageability, which is like, you know, it, that's the emotional side of it. So someone could be stressed, anxious, overwhelmed, depressed, um, that could all form part of unmanageability. And what that happens if they don't work on the inner unmanageability, it starts to form out into external factors in their life, such as work and relationships. Um, the most important thing in that first step is the word we. Um, it doesn't say I admit that I am powerless. It doesn't say that my life has become unmanageable. It's we admitted 
and that our lives have become unmanageable. The most important point of that is, and the reason why that was set up that way, is that no addict or alcoholic can recover by themselves. Um, they can try, it's not very successful. Um, the whole focus on the word we is that this is a fellowship, um, is that your loved one doesn't have to feel alone anymore. They're not suffering alone. There's other people out there that are suffering with the same addiction or the same disease, um, and they rely on each other, you know, in order to help each other recover. So that word we is very, very important. And that's why, you know, when, when we have your loved ones in treatment, we often encourage, you know, community and fellowship. Um, you know, <clears throat> I always say that at least 70% of, of your loved one's recovery comes out of the community and the group work. Um, and by getting involved into a fellowship, um, <clears throat> you know, that's that's very important because you can't you can't recover by yourself. And that's why that first step is saying that we admit it so that you're not, your loved one is not alone in, in admitting that they have a problem. They don't have to feel alone. Um, number two, step two is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So- Sorry, Dom, do you mind if I quickly interject there? Yes, go for it. Yeah, sorry. Just on the, the step one in terms of the powerlessness and the unmanageability that extends, how it can extend to, to loved ones is that the constantly trying to control your loved one's addiction or their movements and that inner, inner um, unmanageability of yourselves having the loved one drive your actions and thoughts and and that. so it's mm. yes this is um this here is about the addicted loved one but the steps can be applied to yourselves in your everyday life so i think on that lolly as well is just for families um and i i, I think it's also in my presentation but there's actually support groups based on the 12 steps. So if you look at your Al-Anon and your Nor-Anon um, and your co -Anon sort of support fellowships for families, um, it, it's the same principle that your loved one would apply when they're going through their recovery. So you as a family, you know, you would have a sponsor, you would also do 12 steps of your own. Um, and it just helps in terms of the family support side of it. Um, because these 12 steps can be applied to the family as well as the one who suffers from the disease of addiction. Then we have step two, which is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Um, it doesn't say that you must believe. It doesn't say that you have to believe. It just says that, you, that you've come to believe that there is a power greater than you that could restore you to sanity. So we often get people that come in here that practice, you know, their own religions, which is great because that means that they've already got a connection to a higher power. Um, they just have to work on strengthening that. And then for those that come in and they're still struggling with that kind of sense is that, you know, through, through, through counseling and through that, we can also help and through the community, they can help to find a higher power of their own understanding. And this is really important because like I mentioned, when you're running on self-will and you're trying to control your disease and you're trying to stop on your own, it doesn't work. You need to have sort of a higher power that you can hand your life over to, or you can hand, you know, situations over to that can help alleviate the stress on yourself. And that's why step two and three actually tie in together, because once you've come to believe that that there's something out there that's bigger than you, you then make that decision to turn your will and your lives over to the care of God as we understood him. So that, um, I think initially in the 1930s, it just said over to the care of God. Um, and then they did change it to say that God as we understood him, so that it becomes more of a spiritual thing and not just a religious thing, so that you know, this, this program can apply to anybody. It doesn't have to be to a specific, you know, to a specific set of rules or guidelines. And we always say that the first three steps is about, is about trusting God um, as you understand him. So it's coming in, admitting that you've got a problem, your life is unmanageable, you need something else that's bigger than you to help you. Um, and then you make that decision that you're going to turn your turn your life over to this higher power. 
Okay, then we've got steps four to, steps four to nine is basically where we clean house, is what we call we clean house. Um, so this is the, the steps four to nine are the steps that are going to be working on yourself as a human being. You know, you're going to be looking at your behavior, your resentments, your fears, um, your shortcomings, your de character defects. Um, and I'll get into that more as I run through the steps, but it's really important to know that four to nine is where you're going to clean house. And this is about taking responsibility, changing your behavior and making amends when necessary. So with step four, where we make a, made a searching and fearless, fearless moral inventory of ourselves is where, as I said, you're going to go, <clears throat> it's a very, it's quite a long step. <laughs> um, and what you do in this step is that you, you know, you write down all your resentments, you write down all your fears, you write down all your feelings, you look at, you know, your relationships, your, you know, what secrets are you holding on to? What are your assets? What are not your assets? Um, so you're really breaking down every single aspect that could be affecting you in your recovery going forward. Um, families will like this one because <laughs> the step four is where you identify who you owe amends to. <laughs> so, so be glad if your name is on the step four list, you know there's an amend coming your way later on. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's where it, it is quite a difficult step and we usually encourage the clients to, to sort of, you know, get through it as, don't rush it, but get through it as swiftly and quickly as possible because it can be quite painful to sit and dig up the past and go through all of that stuff. Um, but the whole point of looking into your resent, you know, what I say, the beautiful thing about step four is you're looking at everything from a different perspective and that way you, you kind of look at your resentments through your loved one's eyes so for example if i'm pissed off with my mother because she didn't give me a hundred bucks for petrol last week i need to look in look at it from a different perspective and think okay but why didn't she give me money it's because i keep using my petrol money to go and buy drugs for example um so you start looking at your behavior and you start to identify what your what your character defects are um <clears throat> and then that ties in with step five where we admitted to God ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrong. So what you then do is you read your entire step four to a sponsor or to a counselor or someone that's, you know, done the steps before, and they help to guide you through that and help you to see things from a different perspective. And in doing that, you get to start to realize and you start to forgive. Um, you start to forgive other people for how they've wronged you. You've started to look at it from a different perspective and you've started to see where you know you've been wrong in those situations then we move to step six is where you'll then make a list of all the character defects that have come up in your step four so it says we are we we were entirely ready to have god remove all these defects of character when we look at defects of character for example it could be manipulation selfishness dishonesty um procrastination being judgmental so there's I think there's a list of like 33 of them somewhere. Um, but you start to sort of look at what are the traits of your character that are that are sort of negative and create, you know, issues in terms of your relationships and all of that going, going that way. Okay, sorry. And then seven, eight, and nine, we humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. And that's the step where we look at our defects and we actually look at which defects that, you know, how, are we willing to let go of them and how are we going to let go of them? And then eight made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. So by this stage, you should be able to have a list of people that you know that you've harmed, whether it's been physically, emotionally, verbally. Um, so if I go back to my example with my mom, like I got really angry and resentful to her because she wouldn't give me a hundred bucks um for for something else and then i identified that okay she's not giving me the money because i'm spending it on things i shouldn't be spending on it and then i see this as a pattern in my life with my mother that i try to manipulate her or i try to lie to her about what i was spending the money on um so she would then need to for example move on to my uh, my amends list um and like i say this is just making the list um, it can be used like people that you were in active addiction with, people that you from institutions, people like this is just a list of people that you've harmed that you now need to go and make amends to. 
And then we make direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So your loved one is not going to apologize for cheating on you. Um, your loved one is not going to apologize for um, you know, doing something that's going to harm you. So that would be something that they would work through with a sponsor, you know, that take their step A, this is my list of people, this is who I need to make amends to and why. Um, and then the sponsor would then guide them into <clears throat> making amends and how to go about making those amends. So like I said, from four to nine is, is what we call cleaning house. So this is where, you know, you look at all of these factors that come into play that are that are part of you because when we look at addiction it's not the substances or the alcohol or the drugs that's a problem it's it's the it's the person so we need to look deep down inside and work on ourselves and figure out what's you know triggering us to use and what resentments we're holding on to and that's how we clean that out and we work on you know what what traits i have that are not beneficial to me um, I'm not sure if there's any questions at this point. All right, so I'm just going to move on to the last three. Um, so this is what we, 10, 11 of 12 is help others or considered like your maintenance steps. So these are three steps that you, you would practice every single day. Um, so step 10 would be continue to take a personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admit it. This is, this is one of my favorite steps. We do it with the clients in, in primary care and, and in secondary care as we do. We ask them to do a, like a diary entry where they have to answer some questions every day and do a reflection on their day. You know, for example, was I angry today? How was I dishonest today? How was I selfish today? And what's really nice about doing this personal inventory on a daily basis is that you can start to see patterns of behavior that might come up that might be concerning and that might need to be addressed with a sponsor. Um, it's really a good way to create awareness around your defects and what's actually coming up for you every single day or what's coming up for you, what's a pattern in your, in your sort of, in your week, for example. Um, and then you would then take that to a sponsor and just say, look, I've been angry for six days at Joe's Soap and I just don't know why and I don't know how to get rid of it. And then your sponsor can help you work through that. Um, 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and power to carry that out. So <clears throat> what that step is essentially helping with is to, you know, to, to constantly maintain a connection with your higher power. You know, it's very, very important. Um, you know, we normally, like gratitude lists are a great way to do that. Um, thanking God for your day is a good way to do that. So it's just maintaining that contact. When I, I find when we're in active addiction, you know, we, we could practice a religion or have a connection with a higher power. But what happens with active addiction is we do become disconnected. So we don't, you know, we can run in and say, yes, I go to church every Sunday, but I'm not really connecting because I'm going to church high, if that makes sense. Um, so this step is really important that they maintain, you know, a relationship with a higher power um, throughout their recovery process. And it is one of the five pillars, which I will get into just now. And then lastly, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. So once you've continued, like once you've, so, so step 12 is essentially carrying the message. So once you, you know, sort of complete the 12 steps and you kind of identified all of this stuff about yourself and you've worked on it and you fixed it and you've sort of maintained some, some recovery and some clean time, it's this step is really great because you can actually use what you've learned and pass it on to other people that are coming into recovery. Um, so it's about helping others and to carry that message that look, there is hope out of active addiction. We, we always say we don't carry the addict, we carry the message. Um, it's about giving other people hope so that they can, you know, end up helping, helping other people. Um, so yeah, I think those, that's basically the, the, the summary of what the 12 steps are. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's any questions or if Lolly, you wanna add anything? <laughs> uh, no, no, I think I think it's, it's good so far. Very clear, Dom, I like it, thanks. I know, it's very concise, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs>
All right, so I just want to quickly jump into some of the fellowships. There's there's three very there's three main fellowships that sort of run in South Africa. Um, obviously, previously mentioned that you know there's smaller fellowships that are running throughout the country, but we have got three sort of main ones that are running. Um, so first one is and and obviously all three. Sorry, just before I get into them, all three fellowships do come through. You know, to they have what they call hospital in institutions, which is a service committee that come through to the rehabs and actually you know bring speakers into the rehabs and get the 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 the, in, the clients you know introduced to these fellowships. So the first one is Cocaine Anonymous. Um, it was formed in 1982 for people who seek recovery from drug addiction. It's very closely related to the Alcoholics Anonymous. I think part of their literature is the Alcoholics uh, Anonymous Big Book, um, but they are unaffiliated groups. Um, the one thing about CA as well is that they don't, they don't really care what you've been addicted to. They just care that you want to look for recovery. So um, many of them, they, 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 they accept everyone who has a desire for freedom from cocaine and all other mind altering substances. So they, they don't discriminate with members. They don't, you know, they're not gonna say, well, you're an alcoholic, you don't do cocaine, so you can't belong here. So they're quite an inclusive fellowship. Um, and like I said, they work very closely with the Alcoholics Anonymous um, big book. Then we have the Narcotics Anonymous, which was founded in 1953. Hello? <laughs> um, yeah, it was founded in 1953. Um, all of these fellowships are nonprofit, by the way. Um, so they also use a 12 step model um, and they were, it was developed for people with varied substance use disorders. And it's one of the, it's the second largest 12 step organization. <laughs> so, so how NA was actually formed um, was that alcoholics didn't want drug addicts at their meetings um, many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> many years ago, it was very, um, you know, before everything sort of became all inclusive, it was very like frowned upon for drug addicts to go to alcoholics, uh, alcoholic meetings. So what they then decided, there was a guy by the name of Jimmy Kay, and he decided to found, take the 12 steps and um, put together a fellowship, um, which became Narcotics Anonymous. So that's just a, a random little history, history buff moment. <laughs> um, we also have, <clears throat> we also have Gamblers Anonymous meetings in South Africa. Obviously all these meetings are worldwide. Um, but this is also a 12 step, um, 12 step fellowship that was founded in 1957. Um, this one is specifically focused on people with compulsive gambling problems. Gambling is quite a large addiction, especially nowadays where everything is available online. So it makes it a lot easier to access um, and people can spend many, many, many hours. Um, gambling is also one of the addictions that has the highest suicide rate. So there is, there is um, a 12 step fellowship for, for compulsive gambling. Um, obviously they meet regularly to share their experiences, strength and hope so that they can help each other solve the problems compulsive gambling has created in their lives. And then obviously carry that message and help others recover from compulsive gambling. Um, as I say, all these, all these different fellowships, they might have different names, but they all follow the same principles and they all follow the same steps. Uh, we also have something, this is actually really important for you guys as, um, as family members. We have something called CODA, which is Codependence Anonymous. Um, also a 12 step program for people who share common desire to develop functional and healthy relationships. It was founded by Ken and Mary Richards, Richardson and the first CODA meeting attended by 30 people was held on October the 22nd, 1986 in the States. Um, it's stabilized at about a thousand meetings with, and with meetings active in 60 other countries and several online that can be reached at www.coda.org. This is one resource that we generally like to recommend for, for family members as well as their, their loved ones who are suffering with addiction, um, as this just helps to 
it's, it's a fellowship that's going to help you create healthy relationships and be able to set healthy boundaries and stuff like that. So we highly recommend this fellowship for, you know, people, you know, just for the family members, as well as, you know, people that we have here in, in treatment with us. Um, again, I mentioned these earlier, we have the Al-Anon and Naranon family groups. I'm not sure if any of them are currently running face to face, but there's plenty online. Um, and these were founded in 1951. So it's based off of a 12-step program, um, but it's for the families and friends of alcoholics. Whether or not the alcoholic recognizes the existence of a drinking problem or seeks help. So whether or not your loved one is in treatment, you can you can attend Al-Anon meetings. Um, and they will obviously, you know, it's also really nice for you as family members just to get that support from other people who are also going through the same thing. Underneath Al-Anon, they've also formed something called Alateen, um, which is for, you know, yeah, children and younger relatives and friends of alcoholics. Um, and then I think there's also something called ACCA, which is adult children, adult children of alcoholics, I think. Um, Another one that we have that's quite prominent in, in South Africa is Overeaters Anonymous. Uh, that was founded in 1960. And this is for people that have problems with relating to food or binge eating or any eating disorders. There's also an, something called EDA, which is Eating Disorders Anonymous. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail, um, but the, the, this is sort of options available if you are suffering with multiple process addictions as well as alcohol or drug addiction. Okay. Hey, so Dom, that's sorry. Um, yes, just on the, yeah, because I mean, you, you spoke a little bit about the Elanon, Alateen, um, and CODA, and it's just re emphasizing that addiction is a family disease. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also important that even if you yourself, are not a person suffering with addiction, and that as family members, you need help, you need support. Also, it's a process that you can't undergo alone um, and shouldn't be expected to. So please, the resources, the help is out there. Um, and it's just a matter of asking for help. And I think if you if you're struggling to find them online, please reach out to your loved ones counselors, and they should mm -hmm. be able to send you some resources as well. Um, you know, just in terms of if you if you're struggling to find it or you need some assistance, you can reach out to to your loved ones counselor. All right, what I'm going to get into now is <laughs> can't see the whole thing because there's a green thing in my way. Um, <laughs> is we're going to get into <clears throat> what it. So a lot of you will hear, particularly in the second conjoint, your loved ones are going to say, "Yeah, I'm going to get a sponsor. I'm going to go to meetings. I'm going to I'm going to see." you know, I'm going to carry on with my step work. So this is what we call the five pillars of recovery. Um, and these are, I always say they're compulsory. Your loved one has to do this when they get out. Otherwise, you know, there's, there's, they need to be able to maintain their recovery. So the first one that we normally say is, is sponsor or sponsorship. And it's not someone who's going to pay for your treatment. That's not, <laughs> that's not what a sponsor does. So a sponsor is someone that has been through the 12 steps before is in recovery they've been clean for at least two years or more um, they they themselves work a program of recovery they go to meetings they also have a sponsor of their own they continue doing step work um, you know it's someone that's that your loved one should be able to lean on and rely on when they're struggling or when they're craving um, or for example they come home and have an argument with you and they get really angry and they throw a tantrum and they storm out of the house, you know, they should be able to phone their sponsor and be like, this is what's just happened. What could I have done differently? What should I do going forward? Um, you know, for them to phone when they're craving. It's, it's a very, very valuable tool. It's almost like a mentor, um, a, a recovery mentor. Um, and the, the, oh, excuse me, the Alcoholics Anonymous, they began with sponsorship when Bill W after he was only a few months sober, was stricken with a powerful urge to drink. Um, and he came up with the thought that he needs another alcoholic to talk to. Um, and he needs another alcoholic as much as he needs, uh, you need another alcoholic just as much as he needs you. And that's how he found Dr. Bob, 
um, these were the two gentlemen I was speaking about in the beginning um, that actually came up with the 12 step concept um, who had also been trying desperately and unsuccessfully to stop drinking and out of their common need that's where AA was born. <clears throat> they didn't use the word sponsor then um, but it's something that's that's now become the common term. Um, and through sponsoring other addicts and alcoholics, so one, your, your loved one should get to a point in their recovery where they can start sponsoring other people. And that just creates that chain link of one addict helping another. Um, it's a very, very pivotal part of recovery. And it's really, you know, we, we try and sort of give contact numbers, um, you know, for potential sponsors if we can. Um, but generally sponsorship is as easy as going to a meeting and putting up your hand and saying, I'm new, I need a sponsor. Can anyone assist me? Um, and like I say, you don't pay for it. It doesn't cost anything. Um, it's just the therapeutic value of one addict helping another. So that is one of the five pillars. Um, so I'll just run through this quickly. Um, a sponsor does everything possible within the limits of personal experience and knowledge to help the newcomer get sober and stay sober through the AA program. They show us shows by present example and drinking history what AA has meant in the sponsor's life, encourages and helps the newcomer to attend a variety of AA meetings to get a number of viewpoints and in interpretations of the AA program, suggests keeping an open mind about AA if the newcomer isn't sure at first whether he or she is an alcoholic and introduces the newcomer to the other members. What they shouldn't do is never take the newcomer's inventory except when asked, Never try to impose personal views on the newcomer. A good sponsor who is an atheist does not try to persuade a religious newcomer to abandon faith, nor does a religious sponsor argue theological matters with an agnostic newcomer, um, does not pretend to know all the answers and does not keep up the pre pretense of being right all the time. And an AA sponsor does not offer professional services such as those provided by counselors, the legal, medical or social work communities, but may sometimes help the newcomer to access professional help if assistance outside the scope of AA is needed. So that's just a rundown. We then get something called service. Um, service keeps you clean. <laughs> and we're not talking, you know, service at church or at a, at a, at a like an animal shelter or like at a soup kitchen. I mean, that service is, you can do that to make yourself feel better about yourself, but we talk about service in the in the 12 step fellowship. Um, service keeps the meetings running. So service keeps the doors of, of the fellowships open. Um, and it's things like setting up the chairs, selling the literature, handing out the key rings, um, just getting like a position at a meeting so that it keeps you accountable in, in order for you to keep going to that meeting. And then also other people will rely on you to be at that meeting and carry a, carry a message. Um, if we don't keep that community of recovering addicts and alcoholics together, um, the, the groups would stop, they would stop working. They would, the doors would close and then there wouldn't be any meetings available for anyone. So it's really important that your loved ones get involved in service at a, at a NA or an AA or a CA meeting or whichever fellowship they decide to, to get involved in. And service goes up many levels. So it starts at a group level, so at your meeting level, and then it can go up to like regional, national, international level if they really want to get committed. Um, I always say one of the best forms of service that, that your loved one could possibly do is look at going into hospital and institution service, whereby they can go into the prisons and the rehabs and that to, to carry a message to other addicts and alcoholics. Um, okay, I'm not going to go through that one. Um, I think higher power we've pretty much touched on, um, whereby it can be anything that a member believes is adequate. Um, some people will go with nature, some people will go with consciousness, some people would like to do Buddha or Allah or God. So it's whatever they feel most comfortable with. Um, and as long as it's something that is greater than them, and this is something that they should maintain a connection with on a daily basis. Um, and it's obviously something that they see as loving and caring. So that's also one important, very, very important pillar. Wait, something's missing here. Hang on. <laughs> There's a slide I'm missing. Go, I apologize. I'm trying to go in my head. Like what, what, is, what it's, are they? SS. 
Oh, there's two actually missing. I apologize. That is my fault. Um, <laughs> so, so the two other pillars that we look at um, in terms of the five pillars, the, the first one is obviously meetings. Um, mm -hmm. It's really, really important that your loved one gets to support groups and meetings outside of treatment once they leave. We usually make a suggestion that they need to attend 90 meetings in 90 days. So they have to attend a meeting every day consecutively for 90 days. This just helps to build a, build a foundation, get connections, um, start fellowshipping, making friends with other recovering addicts and alcoholics, going for coffees and pizzas. Um, so that's that's really important is that they do attend meetings <clears throat> and then the last one is step work <laughs> um, they need to so when we look at the 12 steps depending on the fellowship there's generally written work that they would need to do so answering some questions and then going through that with a sponsor that's the other purpose of the sponsor is to take them through the step work um, and that's the work that's going to help them you know kind of identify all the stuff that I had previously mentioned um in in the 12 steps so yeah those are the five pillars and that's just a a rundown of the 12 step program hmm. thanks dom cool so i think um, yeah we can open for questions or comments or statements or just a random side note is the during my sessions, step work is the one that a lot of people forget when I ask them, they're like, yeah, I'm gonna do the five pillars. I'm like, okay, but what are the five pillars again? And they do it every day. They do, they do. Every day at four mm -hmm. o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I think for about three or four hours on the weekend. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot, it's a lot. Okay, we've got a question there. Um, please clarify, is Alateen for teens of alcoholics or teens struggling with alcohol abuse? I think it's mostly for teens of alcoholics. Yes. I know that there is a, a age limit like in terms of starting age, is it nine or 10? Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'd have to check. Okay. I think it's I think it's from like I think it's only from 13, if I'm not mistaken. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Because I know they have to go through like a like a phase um before mm. like before they can move up into Alateen. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Any support for kids around 10? I Yeah, I think there is. Um, I can, would you be able to send us a message and then I can send you the resources? Will do. Thank you. Wonderful. There's a question from Kim. How important is it for the addict to take responsibility of their own step work? uh yeah that's that's really really important they have they have mm -hmm. to take responsibility for their own recovery mm -hmm. um i know it's very <clears throat> it's very tempting for loved ones um you know to kind of jump on the bandwagon when your loved one gets out of treatment and say are oh, you doing a step work are you going to meetings are you seeing your sponsor you know when last did you see so and so when you know it's really really important for them to take the responsibility because it's like if, you, if we take, for example, someone who's been forced into treatment as opposed to someone who's come in with a gift of desperation, if you want, if, if your loved one wants recovery, they need to put in the effort to do it. 